right, everybody, welcome to Virtual Bourbon. My name is Steve Akeley. We've got a fun event tonight. We've got our flagship whiskey, our most popular series that we do at the ABV Network. As always, I'm joined by four different distillery representatives representing four different brands. And they're gonna be telling us a little bit about their whiskey, about their, their company and about themselves as well. And of course, they'll be leading us through a tasting. As we go through that, we always like to do with our tastings, we like to nose them first, talk about what we're getting on the nose, and then we like to talk about what we get on the taste. So that's the plan. We will uh, go through and introduce each of our four representatives and then start with our first one in just a minute here. But uh, don't forget, leave your microphones on mute throughout the presentation. Uh, as, if you don't mind, we're gonna go around and introduce everyone, then we will get started individually. So first up, this will be the order that we're drinking the whiskey as well. It follows the order on your placemat. So uh, if you've got that, you got your whiskey set up, just uh, this is the order that we'll be going. So first up is from Chicken Cock is gonna be Greg Snyder, the owner and distiller of that company. Hey, Greg, how you doing? There you go, get you off mute there, Steve. Sorry, yeah, I'm doing great, pal. Appreciate the opportunity to join you this evening and, and I was looking forward to the event. Uh, one correction, I am not the owner, actually. I'm the master distiller. So um, actually Grain and Barrel Spirits is the owner of Chicken Cock Whiskey. Okay, I just elevated you. I mean, take that for what it is. You've got it on video now and uh, present. <laughs> well, that. you know, if, if they want to give me an equity piece of it, I, I, <laughs> we'll see. We'll I see. appreciate your help with that. Yeah, these events do carry some weight, so we'll see what happens. Let me know, and if you can get me juiced in too, I'd I'd appreciate that as well. There you go. <laughs> All right, we've got three folks from uh, Copper and Fiddle here. Our buddy Tim here, a regular on these events, introduced us to uh, Rob, Jim, and. And Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> Andrew. Nice. So we, we've got uh, three guys. So, so if you guys, hello, how you doing? And if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your role, so I don't mess anybody any other ones up here. What, what do you Jim, guys? Jim started it, so we'll let him go. Okay. Well, I, 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 uh, I was basically a landlord for a distillery, Copper Fiddle Distillery, going back to nine or uh, twenty thirteen. And uh, when the two gentlemen that uh, opened up Copper Fiddle back in 2013 decided to retire, I had a choice of uh, purchasing a distillery or having a bunch of empty space. So I uh, sort of liked the idea of purchasing the distillery and I hooked up with uh, Andrew here and uh, we decided to, to uh, make a go at it. And uh, that's where Rob came in. Mm -hmm. Rob, uh, Rob was a We'll call it a holdover from the old distillery. Yeah, I was. But, uh, uh, but I think the first thing we wanted to do was uh, make good bourbon. Yeah, I was. So. Uh, <laughs> I was here uh, 2013 from inception. Um, then, uh, like Jim said, the old owners uh, checked out. Jim and Andy came on board. Uh, I liked uh, liked their vibe and where they were going, so I stuck around, and uh, they promoted me to master distiller. Okay. And I would like to say that this is, a, that is, there is a long story <laughs> that we just made real short. <laughs> excellent, excellent. All right, and Andrew, uh, how about you? What's your, what's your role? Jim is a cousin-in-law. We'll just leave it at that because it's a much longer story as well. Uh, reached out to me. I've been doing, I've been running hotels and restaurants for the last 20 years. And, uh, you know, we reached out to me. We took a look at it. So let's, let's, let's give it a go. And uh, took the distillery over in September, 2019. And you'll be able to taste where we've gotten to in that, in that short time. All right, look forward to getting to know a little bit more about that in just a minute. Next up is Landis Rabish of Grand Travis Distillery. Landis, how you doing? Uh, doing good, appreciate uh, being here and seeing all your lovely faces. It's uh, nice to get out, so to speak. <clears throat> yes, continues our streak. We always have a Michigan connection here. So uh, continues that once again. I, I don't know how we've been managed to do it for 10 events, but, uh, and I got some news today that we, we it looks like we're going to be good with the next ones coming up as well. So it sounds like, uh, the Michigan connection will continue. Landis, I've known your father for, for many years. Matter of fact, the first book I ever wrote about bourbon, uh, he was in it. So he's a, he's a great guy and I've done these type of events and things with him before. So this is our first time doing one of these and look forward to, uh, talking to you today. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next up is a personal buddy of mine. I've known this guy for a little while as well. He's come on some shows. He uh, does some work at Neely Family Distillery, so I see him there a lot. And now he's in our, my poker game, uh, Turner Wathen of Rolling Fork Spirits. Turner, how you doing, man? How's it going, guys? Appreciate being here. Yes, yes, you've got to, you've achieved semi regular status in uh, in our game uh, in our uh, um, on the Bourbon Daily too. As a, yeah, as a you know, 
everybody needs someone that sounds more stupid than them. And you know, <laughs> I fill that niche of just signing, sounding pretty dumb and trying really hard. So it's, it's been a blast. Happy to be here. I'm along for the ride. I hope I get to do a couple more of these guys. Okay. And is that Jordan next to you? Who is that next to you? Yeah, the homeless guy. Yeah, that's yeah, Jordan. Yeah. Oh, Jordan. Okay. Yeah, Jordan, uh, uh, co co founder of the company. So, Jordan, how you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. I'm the smart one, and Turner's the stupid one. So, he just makes me look smart. <laughs> Realistically, we're both idiots. So, yeah. Yeah. I, can, I can testify to that. All <laughs> right. All right. Let's get started with uh, going back to Greg Snyder talking a little bit about chicken cock. So, Greg, tell us a little bit about this brand, because this is a brand that has been around forever. So tell us a little bit about the history of that brand before we start tasting. It, yeah, it has indeed, Steve. Yeah, actually, the brand originated in 1856 in wow. Paris, Kentucky. You know, a lot, a lot of people, they, they think it's a new brand. And, and the first question I get when I do tastings is, you know, where'd you come up with that name? And, uh, you know, I didn't. Actually, a guy by the name of James A. Miller built a distillery in Paris, Kentucky and started the brand Chicken Cock Whiskey uh, back in 1856. So. A lot, lot of history. Uh, you know, I know we got limited time, so I won't go delve too deep in the history, but the brand did well. Um, you know, and, and of course, Prohibition came along and shut down. They sold the brand to a company up in Montreal, Canada, uh, which was actually Seagram's, um, but um, wasn't called Seagram's at that time. And um, uh, they actually made a rye whiskey and they bottled it and put it in a tin can. And they sealed that tin can because it protected it when they bootlegged it back across the U.S. Uh, border huh. and so it showed up in a lot of speakeasies but one of its claims to fame it was actually the house whiskey at uh, the cotton club in harlem new york so uh, probably one of the most famous speakeasies during that era um but a lot of a lot of history uh along 1950 the story actually burnt down and the company that owned at that time decided not to rebuild it so um the brand just said idle in 2012 the founder of, of uh, grain and barrel spirits Marty antela was was looking for uh, a whiskey to start, um, a, a whiskey brand that had a lot of history and tradition behind it. And he ran across the uh, chicken cock whiskey and, and uh, kind of fell in love with the story. And so uh, he, he bought the, the brand rights and resurrected it, uh, the brand. And um, as far as my involvement with it, uh, I've been in industry now for 43 years. I actually started in, in 1978 right out of college with Joseph E. Seagrams when they had a plant in, in Louisville. And I worked for Brown Foreman. Uh, I was managing director of, of uh, Wild Turkey for a little over 10 years. Um, you know, worked at a number of different companies over the years. But June of 2017, I decided to wrap up my retirement plan. And that was not retire, but start my own consulting company and share my years of experience and knowledge. And so that's when I hooked up with Grain and Barrel Spirits. And, and Marty shared his vision to, to resurrect the brand back to Kentucky. You know, like many business plans, uh, you know, to create cash flow. He bought some young whiskey initially when he, he uh, bought the brand rights, flavored some of the whiskey, and then he came out with what they called chicken cock heritage and chicken cock bootlegger, which were okay, but again, they were young whiskey. They make a good mixed drink, but they weren't really good sipping whiskey. And so his uh, his vision was to resurrect it back to Kentucky and, and bring it back to its, its high quality prominence uh, uh, in its heyday. And so that's kind of what I've been trying to do with him. Uh, we uh, I negotiated a contract with Bardstown Bourbon Company, and that's where we're actually making our our whiskeys now, uh, bourbon and rye, and mm -hmm. uh, and that's going real well. In the meantime, part of my responsibility is I go out and I try to find good quality whiskey that we can uh, put under the chicken cock label and bridge that gap until ours becomes uh, mature. Right. Greg, uh, one of those initial releases, was that in a, it, well, I know it was, I, I have one that was in an aluminum bottle. Was that done as a, a heritage thing based on the fact they would sneak it in in those aluminum or those metal cans? Or yeah, I think there was some tie there as I understand the, uh, the, the history of the brand um but yeah they they had i think they had a cinnamon flavor they had a root beer flavor they had a couple of flavors and it was in a in a yeah aluminum bottle that's exactly right yeah yeah uh somebody uh member of the audience here jerry daniels is saying you have a connection with barry brangar of uh, william tar distillery do you know about this or barry's saying yes yeah. so what what's he talking about there i'm barry, not sure Barry, you can open up your mic if you want to tell us what uh, what this connection is now that jerry's intrigued everyone yeah, sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity. William Tarr actually owned Chicken Cock before he sold it and then purchased the Ashland Distillery that was the first federally registered distillery in Lexington, Kentucky, and owned it from 1871 to um, 1897, 98. And he brought out Old Elk, Bell of Marion, 
old tar. He kept the Ashland um, label and he had both a sweet mash and a sour mash, but he was a super successful guy. And um, uh, he, he bet on the railroad industry and, and that's what bankrupt him. But um, l let's hear more about chicken cock. I, I'm, I'm so yeah. excited to, to meet Absolutely. these guys and talk about them. Yes, we'll be, uh, Barry will be on the next time we do this in, uh, in, July, in July. Yes, he's booked for that. So it should be good. So Greg, and then uh, you, you come to the, the brand and is, was that what you were you know, charged with, you know, finding this uh, better whiskey and, and, and are, do, you, are you, do you blend the stuff yourself? Are you buying barrels and, and releasing them like that? What, 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 what are you doing beyond just finding the whiskey? Well, exactly. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, Monty, like I said, Monty shared his vision with me and, and wanting to resurrect it back to Kentucky. And we looked at a couple options, but I'd done some work previously uh, when the guys at Bardstown Bourbon Company, Steve Nally, their master distiller, and I go way back. Steve's one of the few guys that's been in the industry a little longer than I have. And, and a good yeah. guy. We've been great friends for a long, long time. And um, and so that's where the connection came there. I, I convinced Monty, let's let's go ahead and, and uh, be a part of that. They have a collaborative distillation program. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, Steve, but basically you know, I give them our mash bill. On a bourbon, our mash bill is 70% corn, 21% rye, 9% malted barley. Uh, and then I also give them the work instructions, the time and temperatures for cooking, you know, the fermentation specification, beer chemistry specification, distillation specs. And then I also select the barrels. Now, through my consulting company and something that we're doing unique for chicken cock that I'm not aware of anybody else doing, I also helped a company in West Virginia uh, start a cooperage. Um, I mentioned my 43 years in the business. 12 of the years of those 43, I worked for Brown Foreman. Well, nine of those 12 years, I actually managed their cooperage operations. And so, you know, I not only made whiskey and aged whiskey and bottled whiskey and shipped whiskey, but... Uh, uh, the, you know, the barrels are an extremely important part of that entire process where it, it, uh, it actually provides 60 to 70 percent of the, of the flavor in a finished bottle of whiskey. So, uh, but through that relationship with the guys out in West Virginia, I helped them uh, get their stave mill going, training their employees how to quarter saw white oak and how to edge it up properly, how to stack it properly and natural air drive properly. And then when the cooperage got started up, I, I went out there and conducted some training as well with their employees getting their cooperage started up. But with that relationship, I actually go out for, for chicken cock whiskey that we're gonna produce. And I actually oversee or actually select the logs that we're gonna use. I'm looking for nothing but really tight grain white oak uh, to build our barrels with. Uh, tight grain being that it's extremely dense, extremely uh, highly concentrated in the hemicellulose and lignin uh, components that you wanna convert into the caramel and vanilla substance when you later on toast the barrel and then, then subsequently charge. So, uh, so I have oversight from, from bark to barrel to bourbon to bottle all the way through. And it's something unique, I think. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody else doing it to that extent, uh, but it's working out well. I taste our whiskeys every six months to see how they're aging and, and they're, they're moving along fantastically. Mm -hmm. And long term, is, is that the plans for the company as well, just to continue to do what you're doing? You've got the partnership. You're basically cooking in someone else's kitchen, uh, as it were. Is that, is that the plan? Or are you guys at any point going to look at building a distillery? Well, you never know what the future holds, Steve, but right now that's the game plan. I mean, uh, don't, don't see that changing anytime soon. That, it's, it's, you know, it works out great. I mean, again, you know, we use their employees, their, um, their equipment. And then when we make our whiskey, I go down and oversee the process. And as I said, I, I taste it every six months to see how it's progressing. And they got a great group of people down there, great facility, and they're making some fantastic whiskey. Okay. All right. With that, Greg, I think we want to try what you got going on here. We're going to start with your bourbon. So tell us a little bit about, you know, what went into this? What are you looking to accomplish as you are out searching for, for the, the bourbon like we're going to be trying tonight? Well, uh, you know, I tell people the last questions I ask is what's its age and what's the mash bill? I usually nose it and then I'll taste it. And if I like it, then I'll get the details later on. Uh, but, but I want something that, that definitely, you know, has, has the, the toasted oak black tones to it. It has definitely the caramel and vanilla or, or the dominant characteristics in it. Um, and then if I can find something that really has some, some complexity, be it, you know, some, some chocolate finishes or, or you know, di different, different variations that good quality whiskey has. Um, and so for this here, I mean, I don't know if you've seen the packages that we have, the, the bourbon and the rye that we're tasting tonight, these are actually pre-prohibition bottles that uh, Chicken Cock was bottled in uh, many years ago. And uh, it's, it's a, you know, attractive package. It's a flash style bottle. Um, but uh, for this bourbon, um, this is actually a blend of a six and a half year old and 15 year old. Okay. 
And the six and a half, I mean, I, I felt, you know, had some great characteristics that I like, but I wanted to kick it up a notch and, and really, you know, kind of make it something, something special. So on the nosing notes, Greg, uh, we've already got coming in here, sweet and light floral notes, some butterscotch, candy pecans, uh, Dr. Pepper, you're talking cherry, vanilla wafers, that type of thing. Uh, another one saying, agree with the Dr. Pepper, black cherry soda, so similar to Dr. Pepper, cream soda, graham crackers. Sounds pretty good on the nose there, my friend. <laughs> so, well, of course, it comes down to the taste. Dr. Pepper, but yeah, I understand Let's the cherry the soda type. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Let's give it a taste and see where we're at. All right. Everybody's saying I can only smell soda, cinnamon candies. Yeah. Well, that's got uh, a little bit uh, a warming to it. I'll say that. So it's real nice on the finish. Um, it's got a little bit of Kentucky hug there. It's, uh, you know, not, not overpowering on, on the burn, but just enough to give you a little hug. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon candies. What, are, what else are we getting on the tasting notes, folks? Cherry cinnamon. Lots on the cherry for sure. Nice barrel toast. Mm -hmm. Graham crackers. Anything else, gang? All right. Let's uh let's let's try the rye here. Lots of rye notes, cinnamon low notes warming up. Yeah. Yeah, it warms up. It, it's, it warms up late too. It's kind of really- It's, it's 90 proof actually. And, and yeah. so the rye is 90 proof as well, so. Okay, okay. Let's talk a little bit about the rye. What uh, what are you looking for when you're when you're doing your rye, Greg? Okay, so, you know, I mentioned I, I was a managing director of Wild Turkey Distillery. And when we, we made a rye back when I was there and I wasn't a big fan of it. It had a little harshness to it, a little bitterness and, and it had about 36% corn at the time. But uh, when I went out and started looking for a ride to, to uh, uh, put it on the chicken cock label, uh, I didn't go too far from home, actually. This is, this is actually produced at Bardstown Bourbon Company. And it's a 95.5 ride, which I, I've tasted some 95.5s. They're absolutely fantastic. Yeah. You certainly get some, some rye on the nose, but you're also getting a, a sweet, I don't know, uh, maybe orange note, kind of? Citrus note, yep, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Andrew's saying baking spice. Yeah, I'm definitely getting spices. I, I like to do a lot of smoking. I have a big green egg, and, and you know, I make my own dry rubs usually, and I get a little paprika and a little cumin uh, in, the, mm -hmm. in the spice notes. Is that 5% malt barley? Yeah, I'm sorry, 95 rye, 5% malted barley. That's correct. Spearmint and sweet field grass. All right, Barry. It's coming up with a different one for us. Sweet field grass. Nice. Let's give it a try and see what we got on the taste. Oh, wow, that's really good. That bubble gum and mint, yeah. Yeah, definitely bubblegum. It's, it's, it's sweet up front, spicy at the back. Lemongrass, orange and clove, black tea, honey notes. Deep caramel note. That balances the spiciness of the rye, yeah. Yes, sir, that is really good. You got some good noses and, and, and uh, palates on this panel. <laughs> it's what's fun about doing this group, the group, uh, tastings like this we do a lot of these things not only these type of events but just individual you know tastings and things like that and always i always find it helps to work with the team and then sometimes you, you when someone says something you pick it up other times you don't but uh it's always interesting well that's what i tell people steve i said you know whenever i do tasting that you know it's it's not an exam there is no right or wrong answer you know what your nose picks up or your palate picks up can be totally different from the person next year or some other people tasting it so but uh but yeah, these, this group is pretty perceptive. They're picking up a lot of the, the key elements that, uh, that I find in it as well. Yeah, very nice. Well, Greg, thank you for joining us. Please stick around and uh, we will have an open Q&A at the end, okay? Very good, yep, sure will, thank you.
Next up is going to be uh, the team from Copper Fiddle. Let's go ahead and pour that one. We usually like to, I should have said that at the first one there. We like to pour as we start talking to our folks, letting that get a little bit of air to it as we discuss company and the whiskey and that type of thing. So if you don't mind, give us a little bit about the history of Copper and Fiddle. I, I know that, uh, you know, you guys uh, are, are newer owners and I know that Rob has a little bit of, of history there. So tell us a little bit about when the company got started and, and that type of thing. I think Rob can give the best. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll give the uh, abbreviated version because uh, we can as, drone. We can <laughs> drone out, <laughs> and I can yeah. Um, so uh, essentially, um, I have uh, some friends in the brewing industry and have brewed on their decks. Um, Revolution, Eris Brewing. For those of you that are in Chicago area, um, so uh, we were. Uh, my wife, my now wife, and I were in Colorado at a wedding, and the then owners, uh, Jose and Fred, were at the same wedding. And before the wedding, we were sitting at a brewery, shooting the uh, shoot, shooting the stuff. I don't want to swear. Um, shooting stuff and just hanging out. And, you can handle uh, it. <laughs> talking about I, we're drinking booze, right? Yeah. Um, talking about uh, you know what it would take to uh, open up a brewery, the square footage, you know, and the liking, the overhead. And I said, you know what, you'd probably be better off just opening a distillery. And they kind of looked at me and said, really? It's like, yeah. So uh, wedding happened three weeks late, three months later down the line. They invited us over for dinner and Jose sprawls out some blueprints on the table and it goes, Hey, what do you think about this? And I was like, what are you doing? Are you nuts? <laughs> um, didn't, he, he never brewed, never distilled anything in his life. He's like, so what do you think? I'm like, well, I think you're nuts, but I'm in. Um, and uh, sure enough, later, five months later, permits come out. Uh, they're looking for uh, getting their tires checked over at uh, Jim's Goodyear down the, next to our distillery. And, uh, looking for a space to operate in and Jim goes, Hey, I got a tire garage. You guys want to go check it out. It's got a floor drain, uh, you know, almost a, uh, 60 yard, 70 yard or 60 foot span. Uh, you guys can uh, go ahead and take a look at it, flip the lights on, like the space fast forward 2013, um, in March, uh, we cut the ribbon and we started operating. Um, then, uh, you know, they, uh, they had, I'm sorry, was it 13? Yeah, 2013, right? What did I say? 14, 2014. 2014. <laughs> They're brewing in 13, open for to the public, started uh, distributing in 2014. We may have been <clears throat> making stuff and not been open. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, push comes to shove, uh, a couple years down the line, um, Jose and Fred want out. And then what Jim was saying of, uh, you know, looking for someone to buy, and he was uh, brought up to the 50-50 coin flip of, do I want an empty space or I want a distillery? Um, well, I spent a lot of I spent a lot of time and birthed a lot of cap uh, political capital to make sure that uh, to get a uh, distillery in the Lake Zurich, Illinois, because that was not on the uh, uh, village's uh, radar at the time. Yeah. So then uh, when Jim when Jim purchased, <laughs> um, he uh, he needed uh, um, more skin in the game with Andy and said, hey, you know what? You've had a lot of experience with uh, restaurants and uh, organizing. Uh, operational capacity within the uh, entertainment uh, space brought on Andy and um, let Andy talk to you about the uh, first yeah. passion. That, well, that was uh, fun. We did. It was a really good time. I should send you some pictures. Um, <laughs> so we inherited, you know, a, a, a full synthetic, you know, regiment conversion of sugar with, you know, feed corn, you know, from, from, from tractor supply, the stuff that makes, you know, cows and pigs fat and happy can potentially make good whiskey. Um, and, and in doing that, and we kind of met a pretty disgruntled Rob who had always had a ton of integrity and really fell out of love with, with the process and um, really didn't want to stick around. He kind of told us that carte blanche when, he, when we met him. He's like, I don't have a passion for this. I don't believe in, in the product. So take good notes. And, you know, me being a hospitality guy, Jim being, you know, a tire and, and a Goodyear owner, we had to take really, really good notes. And, you know, that losing you know, the, the ability to learn hands-on how to distill was, was a pretty big setback right off the bat. But, you know, through, you know, my hospitality finagling and, and just talking with Rob through the day, we just asked him, carte blanche, Rob, what would you do? Like, could you even potentially make good booze here? Jim and I have spoke from the beginning before we even took this over. It's like, we want to make the best possible hooch we can from here to Kentucky. Is that even possible within this footprint? And Rob said, well, yeah, you just, you can do it. It's, it's all by hand. It's a, it's all a full blown, you know, small batch hand done procedure, but you got the wrong ingredients. You have the wrong still, the wrong process. If you change that process, we could probably make that happen. But, you know, he was out. So I asked him, like, why don't we just not 
do this, what we're doing right now. You tell me what you want to do. Tell me what you need to do it. Let's get it. Come show me again. Then I'll take good notes. And through that conversation, it was pretty quick that we named him and saw the talent level with him or into our master distiller role. Yeah, so, so he was not going to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I, he tried. As soon as he, he said, he, as soon as he said he wasn't going to hang around, that that was the challenge to make yeah. him hang around. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, but it sounds like you guys started with kind of a clean slate. You did get a new still, and uh, you're no, you're no, no, no. We we still ah, great fun. Still <laughs> got the same still. Uh, but what okay. we did move was over to uh, Illinois sweet corn with a, a malted barley that has what is 190. 129.3 degrees Littner that has the ability to convert all the available sugar that we need to only do single pot still runs and not have to rely on a ton of reflux, get the ethanol up and let the age do the talking. Now we're kind of at a point where we're still doing single pot still runs with a naturally converted sugar process that lets our mash kind of speak as loudly as, 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 our, as our aging is at this point. So we're able to take a synthetic process and move it into a, a natural process that's created what you have in front of you now. Okay. Okay. And so tell us a little bit about, you know, your signature whiskey here. What, what, what went into that? How do you come up with the mash bill and, and all those things that, that make the whiskey that we're going to be trying in just a moment here? So you, you were able to create a, a heck of a spreadsheet. This has all been, you know, trial by fire with, with Rob also having a full-time job that he does kind of consulting me either via multiple text messages and crazy, ah, what am I doing wrong here? Um, but we moved over to that Illinois sweet corn, uh, a Minnesota malted uh, barley and a Minnesota cereal grain rye. And we came up with kind of a 70, um, it's like a 70, 12, 18 regimen of, of sweet corn, rye to barley. And what you're getting now is a whiskey that's been fully converted to sugar, as I stated, um, the corn and the rye, we let it gelatinize for about two hours in 100 and, or 200 degree water, bring that down to about 160, pitch the rye, let the rye convert down from 150 through all its diastatic power. And that's where we get our wort. That wort, we use a pathfinder yeast to uh, ferment out and we pitch it into, or sorry, run it into a 140 gallon pot still, just single column pot still, uh, no plates let it go one run and we usually end up in barrel about anywhere from 92.1 proof on when I didn't know what I was doing. And now we're, you know, we're kind of hitting that benchmark of 108, 110 proof. And uh, we go into a 15 gallon number four uh, char quarter cask. So yeah. kind of, we want those kind of dark fruit coffee notes that you get from a number four char to really complement that sweetness that we're getting from the Illinois sweet corn the pepper and the smoke notes from the rye and the bready notes from the barley all have kind of made this very harmonious whiskey that we've been able to produce. And you know, this is our first ever, I gotta brag a little bit, our first ever distiller, as a distillery, the first time we've ever won you know, a double gold medal uh, with what you're drinking now. And this okay. is about nine that's months. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. At nine months and quarter cast, three months we finish on toasted oak staves, all, okay. coming, out, all coming out of Minnesota. All coming out of Minnesota. Okay. All right. Well, let's give this one a taste and uh, see what we got going on here. Let's uh, on the nose, a lot of stuff coming in there, folks. You see, so uh, bold, smoky, I'm seeing. Smells kind of like a tequila. Someone corrects and says a mezcal, which makes kind of more sense. Um, muscat even. I don't know. Maybe that was meant to be mezcal, but maybe it is muscat. I don't know. Uh, smoked tequila, mezcal, nose very veg vegetal, very sweet, smoky. Are you using 53 gal barrels? No, we heard 15. that. 15, yep. Tim, agree with Cynthia or John, who, as it were. Uh, thick viscous, campfire sweet, light smoke. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about on the nose there certainly is some smoke there where, where, where do you think we're picking that a lot from, from the uh, northern minnesota rye and then again from that number mm -hmm. four char number four char okay and that uh that mezcali smokiness is coming from uh so when you think about this the staves um in a barrel right so you have the surface to mass ratio of the liquid to um the wood that's why we're using 15s it kind of expedites the aging process more surface to mass ratio of liquid to wood um, and then to finish off, to get our flavor profile of throwing the stave inside the, inside the liquid itself, is you're getting a lot more surface to mass ratio of liquid on the wood. Um, that 
intense smokiness is coming from that contact once it hits the stave in which we'll regulate um, and how long it'll sit on that stave in order to get our flavor profile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm getting, you know, the, the smokiness, like people say, but I also get kind of yeah. chocolatey, like kind of chocolate pop tarts or something. I mean, yep. that's, that's interesting. So, oh. all right, let's, let's Somebody, taste. If somebody's going to say our stuff is baller. Then I'm going to show them our still. <laughs> that's that's Lenny. Show us, show us the still. Show us the still. That's Lenny. He, he uh thanks, Lenny. That's the copper pot still right there. 140 gallon from at least the Confederate stills of Alabama. A guy named the Colonel made it. I have the exact that's same still. still here. Yes. So a little bit so of light so. reflux in the hat, and that's it. So, so do you guys run it? Do you run it steam or direct fire? Direct fire. Three, uh, three propane direct fire ports underneath connected to 240 gallon tanks outside. Very carefully. Very carefully. <laughs> no, I, I know. I, I've run the same exact same still direct fire for seven years, eight years. And nice. uh, we recently decommissioned it, but that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah it's cool to taste this Daniel's and know that we ran the same stills. That's awesome. Have you ever, have you ever talked to the Colonel? Yeah. He's oh, crazy. He's awesome. <laughs> He's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. Appreciate so it. Thank Williams you. Uh, yeah. Deer Hammer Distilling in, in uh, Buena Vista, Colorado. So that's where Lenny's from. That's awesome. Deer Hammer. All right, let's give this thing a taste and see what we got here. Favorite show. Wait to see who says that. Bruce is saying a uh, dark fired corn product, smoky and deep, loves it. Liquid campfire from Casey. I'm thinking smoked brisket. Nice. Anybody yeah. picking up a uh, uh, ballpark peanut? Ballpark peanut. So I think every time I pitch the corn, because you pitch the corn then the rye, you just get that peanut thing every time. Like a like a peanut dust, like the ballpark peanut dust, or like the shell of a peanut. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that salinity. It, yeah. it really stays on the front of your tongue. It really just brings it out. Yeah, Not to be persuasive at all or anything, but your palate is your palate. Don't let anybody tell you different. Chocolate covered roasted roast 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 peanuts. peanuts. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, Barry. Awesome, man. Light licorice, aldehyde, almond, nut. Nut. Yeah. Are you describing us or the booze? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Yes, very, very good, gentlemen. Very different. What's the uh, what's the proof? What are we like? Ninety two proof. Ninety two. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Very balanced. All over you. Love the smokiness, says Bill. Yeah, that's that's good. Very, very different. This is what's great about these events. We get to try some very unique things, things we normally wouldn't get to try. What's your footprint look like as far as your distribution? Uh, so right now we just signed up with Spirit Hub. Uh, that'll put us, you know, direct to consumer in Illinois. Uh, they're also in um, North Dakota, Nebraska, New Hampshire. Um, we're all over Illinois. We just started in Wisconsin. Uh, we're in California and New York with uh, Liberty Distribution as well. Okay. Okay. So the, the bulk of what we do, we do here. Like if I if I could model a distillery's footprint for 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 revenue, it would be you know French Lick Spirits. Like what, what they do, it's, it's all about their town, what they make, it's released there. It is, you know, you come and get it if you want it, but that's not, that doesn't work for us. So we're kind of slowly expanding the distribution while COVID's given us you know, a good amount of time to really master not only process, but backstock of, of, of aging. So we never had to source any, any product. We've only produced, only been able to serve what we've, what we've produced ourselves, which is great. Are you all over Illinois or just uh, no, in the Chicago? Yeah, if What's you want to email me directly, Andrew at copperfiddle.com. If you have a liquor store that, that you want to see us in, I will uh, connect them with uh, with our distribu distributor and they'll, they'll get it in. Yeah, because I'm, I'm in St. Louis, which, you know, Illinois is just a, a bridge separating us. So, yeah, I'm, I'm over there all the time. But I, I can't say I've seen Copper Fiddle, but I... I can't say that I've always been looking for it either. And it's something that I do want to look for now. So I'll, I'll see if it's, I'll see if it is out there. And if not, I'll, I'll email you and we'll get it. We'll get oh, it. We can also yeah. self distribute. So if I have to meet you on the other side of the bridge with the case, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can make that work. 
<laughs> Let's do it. If you do that, you better meet up for a couple beers and some briskets or something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, you can come by the house, and uh, you know I got a I got a decent bourbon collection, so you can. There's plenty. You can imagine there, you. Sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, gentlemen, thanks for talking to us tonight. And again, please hang around to the end. We'll have some uh, Q&A where some folks can ask you some questions. So excellent. Thank you. All right. Next up, let's uh, let's bring Landis back in. Landis, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. So Landis, tell us a little bit about your story. Obviously, uh, you know, your father started the distillery. So and and he's he's been in this thing a while. So did you kind of grow up in the business. Uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got into it. So he was a pharmaceutical sales rep for plus 30 years. Um, uh -huh. Now there, there's a family story to this too. So <clears throat> uh, my grandfather, uh, my dad's father, immigrated from Poland um, and they were farmers in Poland. They were farmers here in Standish, Michigan, uh, had, a, had a lot of land and a part of that was running a still. And I don't know too much about that. Um, all I knew was it was something that did on a pretty daily basis, Polish family, it wasn't whiskey, it was, it was vodka. Um, and they ran that through prohibition and then it kind of died out. Um, and I mean, there, there are stories of Aunt Phyllis cleaning out, you know, the old shed and they, they, they found, of course, my Aunt Phyllis is years after my uncle Alex had, had passed and they, they found the still and they got rid of it, you know, cause they, they were, they were, you know, proper and, you know, to be right. affiliated with that, you know. 30, 40 years ago, they didn't like it, um, which is kind of a shame, but they'd found some notes, they'd found some jugs and our first product, you know, you talk about how do you get up and rolling as a distillery, um, you know, you're either buying stuff or you're, you're, you're building a cash flow other ways. For us, it was vodka. We started with a traditional rye Polish vodka. And then from there, we invested some of our returns into whiskeys and, and moved that forward. So um, it was 2005 when we were, uh, kind of getting the ball rolling. We were in production 2006, but you know, this was back when there wasn't many smaller distilleries and my dad had taken a trip out East. It was another small craft distillery. Some friends said, Hey, we're going to go to a tasting room, try some vodka. And here we are a Polish family and we get together, we drink vodka. And um, you know, he was like, what do you mean a, a local vodka and tried it. And it, he liked it. He, you know, came back to the Midwest looking for local products to buy and couldn't really find any. Um, so at that point he decided to kind of take a stab and like I said, pharmaceuticals for, for 30 years, he was biology, he was chemistry, um, and, you know, kind of took a leap at it. And that's kind of where I got involved. So he had put it together, got everything up and running. I was younger at that point. I was finishing uh, a four-year degree at uh, central Michigan and I kind of knowing that's what he was going to do. I never thought I'd be in production. Um, so my degree was, I mean, basically HR communication, sales management. And in my first jobs at the distillery were launching a retail tasting room. It was hitting, you know, basically Cadillac and South introducing product across the state back when we had, you know, two vodkas. Um, and I was based out of central Michigan and this must've been 2009, right around the 2008, 2009, I was doing Monday through Friday statewide hidden accounts. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, traveling up to run the tasting room. Cause at that point we were only producing a couple days a week. We had this tasting room. We had, you know, needed more staff and it became kind of like a, so he was working at that time with a gentleman, uh, a family friend of ours named George Wortman. And um, being the younger guy, I would always get stuck doing the mill and doing the cleaning and the sanitation and this and that. And by the time they need another full-time staffer in production, um, I was fully trained and I moved up. And so I'd been kind of working full-time production since uh, 2011 had been working part-time before that. And I've been leading our distillery uh, now since was this like year seven. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're, <clears throat> he had, he had a lot of information, a lot of experience and a lot of research into it initially. And then and then you realize whatever you learn, whatever you think you know, when you're in it, when you have the equipment and you're trying it, um, then the job really begins of trial and error, moving things forward, lots of research. So for me, when I got involved, um, 
it was kind of absorbing as much information as I could, looking at what they were doing and then trying to think of ways to improve efficiency, play with flavor, move forward. And, and the old George we're trying today um, was our very first whiskey we put up. And, you know, coming from, so we have a 16 plate Holstein still, and uh, it's got catalyzer, um, the flag mater. I mean, it really is a vodka still, but we can bypass that and run it as a pot still. Now, my whiskeys are normally um, medium reflux, uh, medium pressure one to two plates on our second column, um, uh, you know, coming in maybe at the high side of, you know, that 150 range, about 159, 158, right around there, run it as clean as we can while retaining as much flavor as we can. Um, but, you know, that's something that we had been working on for a long time and we're still making tweaks, you know, even today <clears throat> we have a, actually we, we fired up now a, a new still. So we have a 300 gallon Holstein we've been running for a year now um, a 600 gallon Holstein, um, kind of the, the new mash still. And we're kind of having to go back to the basics on that one and redesign a plan. It just, it behaves differently in, in almost every way. Um, so that's what our last, you know, two or three months have been is running new whiskeys, but trying to find our balance on the new equipment. Um, but I guess I end up rambling a, a fair bit there, but yeah, uh, established in 2005, we've been producing since 2006. Um, I've been, uh, working production for about a decade there. Yeah. And when you go back, I mean, you're talking ancient history in, in craft distilling 2005. So how, how many <laughs> other distilleries were there in Michigan approximately at that time? There weren't many. We were the first in Michigan. Now there were wineries that held DSPs. I can go back and look at, um, you know, the federal database on DSPs by state, uh, or one five zero zero three. I think there were two or three before us and none of them were distilleries, um, but then we were, we were talking to a glass broker years and years ago, and, and uh, they looked at our DSP and they said, well, you must have been one of the first ones. As a matter of fact, I think you were within one of the first 30 um, in the U.S. I don't know if that's true or not. I know that when Kent went to the first ADI meeting, it was like him and 12 guys, and it was just they stayed at a hotel and met at the lounge. And if you go to the ADI today, it's mm -hmm. thousands of people. Um, it a much a much bigger event. Of course, it's a much bigger industry, um, which is absolutely fantastic. You know, I, 10 years ago, nine years ago, trying to problem shoot um, things at a distillery. It's like the only equipment we could find was meant for a large, large distillery. So here we are cobbling together equipment. And now there's a lot of options on how to deal with stuff, but in a kind of in a format that is applicable for a small distillery that can't spend, you know, $40,000 on a single piece of equipment to do a very narrow job so i mean the, the industry itself has blown up uh, and that's done i think nothing but good things as far as you know competition elevating the game um but then you know looking at uh, you know equipment looking at suppliers looking at you know all the things associated with it the first time i talked to your father was back in i, I think that book came out in 2014 that uh, i featured him in and i know one of the things that was big for you guys at least at that time <clears throat> was you you had several other tasting rooms too not, not only do you have the distillery but you had a few tasting rooms at some very touristy places is that still the case today you guys still into that business yeah it is i mean the the ratio is constantly changing because <clears throat> michigan's a very high excise tax state um, mm -hmm. And when you have your own taste room, granted, you are running your taste room, there's added overhead, uh, but you can kind of play with the pricing on that end. Um, so for us, you know, looking at how that was operating, I mean, we liked the idea of, you know, having, you know, the distillery in Traverse City, come take a tour, we can sample you, we can do all that fun stuff. We have a room in, uh, uh, you know, just south of the bridge, we have a room in Frankenmuth, Michigan. Um, we have one in Leland, Michigan, we've had them in a couple different places outside of that too, that were kind of trying to dial in, but, but ultimately we liked, again, because craft distillation was so new, people didn't really know what to look for. You know, they come in and try a, you know, 39 plate rye vodka and be like, well, it doesn't taste like, you know, absolute, you know, it's, it's not neutral. And then you would say, well, it's not supposed to be neutral. We're making a traditional vodka. It's not carbon filtered. It's um, high reflux, but it will be more grain forward. So there was a lot of education uh, toward a, a customer base, um, which, I mean, ultimately is why we decided to go that route. Now today, I mean, we still have five tasting rooms today, um, but we're putting much more time and attention to growing our local Michigan market, um, you know, Illinois to an extent. But uh, yeah, and there are not many distilleries in Michigan doing that. Um, but, you know, again, we liked it because 
it's it's us we can you know we can be the people behind the bar educating the customer on the product why it tastes the way it does how it was made and all that okay so and, and before we get into the tasting and hopefully everybody's got their pour there's poor and if not please do so now but uh, old george is that named after the former distiller that kind of you worked with or is there a different inspiration for that name well, it's twofold and, you know, you know, paying uh, homage to, to George Wortman, who did uh, a lot of work for us early on back when my dad was working a full time day job and that would come in to finish out evenings. I mean, George was a guy who kind of held down the fort until I started being involved in the production side of things. Um, but that's my great grandfather. So my my grandfather, Edward Ravish, who came from Poland as a child, uh, it was his father, George Ravish, who ran the still pre prohibition. Um, and so it was kind of an homage to, you know, to George Wortman, who had been working with us, a uh, family friend. Um, but, but in a larger part, it was uh, to, you know, my great grandfather who, you know, and again, there was a history. They did that. They did that over there. They did that over here to an extent. Oh, very nice. It's nice when those things work out where you can uh, celebrate uh, uh, two different people with one name. It's like my daughter, uh, her name's Catherine, and uh, it's named after grandmothers on both sides. So it just works out perfectly. So yeah, it's, it's kind efficient. Of yes, it is efficient. So so it's cool. All right. So tell us a little bit about Old George. This is a rye 100 proof. <laughs> what, what else do we need to know about it before we start talking some notes here? Well, uh, it's 100% rye, but it's a 95.5. So we're 95% we're, uh, raw rye from Northern Michigan. Um, and then we're 5% malted rye also from Northern Michigan. So we're lucky enough, we have a malting house about a mile and a half away from where we are. And they source grain exclusively from the region. So 100% rye. Um, and, you know, we've done different mash bills. Obviously, we make bourbon. We've done a 60-40 uh, rye whiskey, uh, rye whiskey and uh, corn with, with a touch of malt to it. But um, so few people do high rye, <clears throat> at least back when we were kind of looking at it. And we said, hey, you know, where are we going to you know, where are we going to stand on this? We like to showcase grain. So when we have a rye vodka, it's 100% rye. When we have a wheat vodka, it's 100% wheat. And we said, well, we're going to make a rye whiskey. Let's do 100% rye. Uh, rye whiskey, 100% rye. So that's the mash bill on it. Now, the distillation on this, I talked a little bit about earlier. I mean, it's, um, it's a pretty mellow pressure. Uh, I would say probably more than a gentle amount of reflux on it. Um, and it's, it's two plates. So you know, run through the still, two plates, single pass through, batch average, about 158, 159. And this particular blend, it's four barrels, uh, you know, same same weeks worth of work. So normally how I do it is I'll run, we can put up about eight barrels in a week and I'll blend those eight barrels down in a tank, fill eight barrels from the tank, and then they go up. So when I pull my barrels down in sets of eight, I know that's from one week's worth of work and we kind of homogenize them. Um, and even then it's very interesting how you can have eight barrels go up at the same time from the same week's worth of work blended and every single one of those eight barrels will taste different. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, talking about, uh, you know, barrels and how important barrels are. And it's true. And I'll, I'll say this when I'm giving tours and, you know, it's like in the life of a distiller, um, you know, we're a very small handhold on the finished spirit. You know, you talk about um, a farmer who plants the grain, tends it, harvests it for a season, gives it to us. So, you know, it takes me eight hours to mash it, cook it and cool it, get my, you know, reactions done um, five, six days to ferment it you know, maybe nine hours to run that through the still. So I've got it for a week and then it hits a barrel. And from that barrel it's going to sit for one year, two year, three year, four year and beyond. So, I mean, there's so many important things when you're looking at the raw ingredient and then the finished glass when you're done. And realistically, what we do as distillers is very important. Um, but I, I think there's so much else going on there. And it just reminds me every time I, you know, pull eight barrels down and I have to try each of those eight barrels, to know which four I'm going to put together for a, a bottling run. And ultimately all of our batches, unless they're a single barrel, they're all four barrels. And the reason is four barrels about as much as we can hold proof down in our, our bottling tank. Um, so what we've got here is about a four-year-old product. that's at a hundred proof. Um, now, uh, you guys earlier um, over there, we're talking about stay finishing and what we use is an American, uh, American oak, char level number four, ISC barrel, uh, no toast. But then what we'll do about a week and a half to two weeks before we take them down, 
Um, I'll put a couple staves in. So we're getting the toasted staves, um, a couple variety. Uh, they are, um, you know, tight grain and in the whole toast, the two different ones, it's basically it's time and it's temperature and which, which profiles are trying to elevate. Um, so basically trying to add a little bit of body, um, a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of that sweetness to it to kind of even it out. Um, and, you know, nowadays, you know, we're, we're buying barrels that have a toast on them as well. And there are so many different cooperages out there offering products like that. And shit, there's even guys out there offering, you know, chips and staves and, and so many other things. And, and ultimately, um, it just elevates the product. So what we've got is four-year-old whiskey, blend of four barrels, 100% rye, um, you know, ISC, tri level number four. And each of those barrels has about two extra staves added to them for the last about week and a half to two weeks that they are in barrel before we bring them out, blend them together, proof them down to 100 and bottle them. So Landis, are you reading some of these uh, nosing notes here? I mean, you're talking strawberries and cream, green apple honey, light flavor. I was so busy looking at you guys, oh, I was not. White chocolate, apricots, chewing gum, northern rice, sweet baking spices. A lot going on here, man. Light yeah. Color. And it's interesting because I feel like this is one of our more tamer batches. And we have some stuff coming through that is just in your face rye. And, you know, like I said, when we're doing, I mean, you know, looking 1200 pounds of grain into a 600 gallon fermenter, you know, that through, through, through the still, I mean, each day's run will be different. I mean, we're on the same water main as our neighbors are. So when they decide to get handsy on the hot and cold water, <clears throat> you know, we, we see and adjust uh, the reflex on our end and the pressure on our end, but it's just, it's kind of crazy to see the differences. And, you know, it goes back to, this is a great batch. Um, the batch before this great batch, very different. Um, and you'll get similarities. I mean, we're using a very basic ethanol production yeast, uh, very wide ABV range, very wide temperature range. Um, and ultimately, you know, we kind of chose that yeast because we didn't want the yeast to have an impact on the flavor. We wanted uh, distillation technique. We wanted grain choice. We wanted barrel choice to show differences. Um, so we kind of, and it's actually everything that we make at the distillery, vodka, whiskey, gin, um, they all use that same yeast. I guess the one the one outlier would be a, we do a rum distilled from Caribbean fancy molasses, and that uses a combination of a champagne yeast with an, uh, an ethanol yeast. Well, my friend, when I taste this, I'm getting I'm getting the spice of the rice, so you're getting some some pepper spices, but also very sweet on the taste. And you know, like apricot, I would say. I mean, it's it's really good. What what somebody else getting as they taste this one? And if you haven't done so already, please do. It's oh yeah, I like it. So we started um. The old George used to be a 93 proof product because, you know, eight years ago, we decided we tried a bunch of different proofs and we, you know, we liked 93. Well, about six months ago, we moved to 100 proof. We just thought it tasted better to 100 proof. It had the body and the flavor to back up that higher proof rating. Um, and actually, about the same time we upped it, we did a price reduction. So it's a $49.99 bottle at 100 proof. And I would say within six months, all of the rye whiskey and bourbon coming down will qualify for the bottled and bond. Nice. Um, and uh, I mean, we're, we're about four years on this right now. It's kind of one of those where as runs are being pulled down, some of them are three and a half, you know, three and three quarters, four, just over four. So until we have kind of consistency and runs coming down, we won't adopt the bottled and bond label, but um, as a fun note, uh, we released a product this week at just a limited, <clears throat> But we did a 10 year bottle and bond rye. So I, they're, you know, kind of hoarded some bottles back in the day or some barrels back in the day. It was one of those where, you know, you're, you're running low and it's like, well, you know, I, I took five and I kind of tucked them away. And I said for, for later use, and we tapped a couple at six years. And then my last two, we hit uh, 10 years in a month. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe that's something we can do on a, on a future taste because I've definitely squirreled some of those bottles away. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Love to love to do that. Is that, and then is that available through the distillery? Yeah, tasting room purchase only on, on the 10 year. Um, okay. This stuff. How, how so, close do you have a tasting room to Lansing, Michigan? Is there ever to be some in Justine? Uh, <laughs> Frankenmuth isn't far from that. I mean, in the grand scheme of things. So anything that we do limited gets shipped down to Frankenmuth as well. They're one of our biggest, uh, biggest tasting rooms. Very nice. Very nice. Well, great, great stuff here and uh, very enjoyable. And Landis, if you don't mind, stick around and uh, we'll ask you some questions at the end too, okay? Yeah, sure. All right. Next up, 
couple of guys here. Well, I saw Friday dudes. night. So we've got uh, Turner and Jordan. Hey guys, how's it going? This has been awesome, Steve. Man, thanks, thanks for the invite. And you know, you know, Landis, uh, and, and kudos to all you guys. I know Lenny's all on here. Uh, so Jordan and I have a great respect for um, everyone that is uh, actually doing their own distilling. Uh, we are. You know, I'll get into the backstory in a second, but um, to be very candid. We're independent bottlers and importers. So we import rums from all across the Caribbean, barrel age them and bottle them in Kentucky. Uh, and it's just, we just really are huge fans of the whole craft spirits movement, uh, that which Steve, you're, you're a part of endorsing and, and bringing to life. And so we got a lot of respect for anybody that's actually running the still. And we could we could do a whole one of these a Turner and his family history. Obviously, Wathen, you recognize that name. You've probably seen Wathen's whiskey. That's it. All goes back. To, Turner's part of that uh, that lineage, that family, and uh, you know, and he's got great stories. And literally, at one point, their family was more important in the bourbon industry than the Beam family. It's hard to believe now. Now we think everything. We think Beam's the longest. They've been around. They're the biggest. They've always been the, the biggest. And at one point, the Wathens were really the, the biggest thing going, but there's a whole story that goes into that and how the, ultimately they, they got out of it. And Turner's, you know, involved in kind of bringing the family back, though he didn't go with, with whiskey, he went with rum. But your first, one of the, I don't know if it was your very that's first- That's Jordan's one. fuck up. That's, 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 all, that's, <laughs> that's my fault. That's, that's yeah. his fuck up, man. But, we, but you guys did have a mis mistake that was made on one of your, maybe your first or one of your early rums that involved you getting in the whiskey business, right? So the name Rolling Fork uh, goes back to the first Wathen distillery that was opened in 1786, the Rolling Fork Distillery. So that was operated up and through the Civil War, uh, through two generations of Wathens. And then we grew out of that, uh, the Ellen and, I know, they grew out of that, uh, moved up into Louisville uh, with the Ellen and Railroad and the Ohio River and transit down to Louisiana. Um, and we, we managed to stay alive up and through Prohibition, which we merged into National Distillers. Um, Jordan and I got into this in 2012, and we started working on a project, which you guys are gonna try, or El Salvador. And we really wanted to find a rum that was well-balanced, that we could show the influence of aging on. And so we'll talk about that in a second, but in the process, when we first started, we found some really nice rum out of Trinidad. And we were, um, we were going to finish it in a variety of barrels, but our contract facility, uh, I was there that day, they were moving the rum from bourbon to rot to port barrels, and they dumped it into a vat of, of MGP rye whiskey. So our first product is a fuck up. It's a complete mistake. <laughs> And that's why we call it. That's how he is, folks. <laughs> we indirectly got into the whiskey business, Steve, not by uh, intention, but by accident. So, by accident, uh, you were, yeah, suddenly. So the, the, the company does that. And they're like, okay, this is yours now. You just bought this, even though you didn't do anything. So you're, now you've got a product. Yeah, that's a they tried to bill us for the rye whiskey. And my point was, <laughs> well, you can have it back. And they kind of looked at me. Just well, separate. I, I was like, hey, you know, that's your problem, not mine. And so, right. yeah, there was a lot of cuss words, but I kind of explained I wasn't paying them for the rye whiskey. They could just take it back out of my rum if they wanted it so bad. Right. But then, as ultimately, one of those stories, as you taste it, you're yeah. like, hey, th this is pretty darn good, right? Yeah. So, um, I was panicking, and uh, one of our partners was like, let's try it. Uh, and we tried it in the parking lot. And I called Jordan and I was like, so we fucked everything up, but we now have a new product. And uh, within 36 hours of phone calls and group texts and, and talking, uh, we came up with a new brand. We already had a designer starting to rebrand it. Uh, we picked out a new bottle type and we were figuring out how to take it to market as soon as possible because we thought the other facility was gonna find a way to steal it. Uh, so we, we did everything we could to bottle it as soon as possible because we we really did think I slept in a car outside of that facility, <laughs> uh, making sure they knew that I was there morning to night 
so that they did not try to acquire yeah. our product. It got a little weird because at first they were like, oh, you know, we want to bill you and everything. And then they're like, okay, we won't do that. But then they're like, we'll just buy it off of you. And that was like two days later. I was like, you guys tried it, didn't you? Yeah. Like, you tried it, thought it tasted pretty interesting and like something no one else had done. And so now you're going to try to buy it from us. Like, no, it was a really weird relationship after that. Then they took me out to dinner and coached me on how to tell a story about it, which is that my wife, I told my wife to go pour me a rum cocktail and she poured me a rye cocktail and there then I added rum to it and made this new product. And I was like, that's fucking stupid. There's a lot of really good mixologists in, in cocktail enthusiasts that already mix rum and rye. It's a fucking terrible story. I'm just going to tell people you guys screwed this up. Yeah. 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 So fast forward today, you guys then, you, you, you continue to, to, you know, import different rums from different countries and things like that, uh, do uh, bottlings. And uh, the one that you've got for us today is called Kentucky Cask. So I assume this has so, a special meaning to it. So tell us a little bit about, uh, about this particular one we're going to be yeah, doing. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you go, bro. So this was like, actually, we finally got it right. So, you know, the first one we started with doing like ex-bourbon, ex-rye barrels, and then it went into, got mixed with rye whiskey. And we're like, well, shit, let's we'll start again. So our second round of this, we, uh, we call it Kentucky Cask because we imported the rum at 10 years old. But then we started aging it in Kentucky in a bourbon warehouse and different types of ex-bourbon, ex-rye, and then export and ex-sherry barrels. So if you know a lot about, you know, rum and scotch and then bourbon and anything else, like Kentucky warehouses are kind of unique. Uh, American warehouses in general, if you get into Indiana too, we do a lot of aging, you know, on the side of the barrel with spacing in between. So you get a lot of breathability in the barrel. Whereas we don't like stack, you know, on pallets where there's not a lot of space between um, and it's upright. So we call this Kentucky cask because we treated it kind of like bourbon is treated in Kentucky. And we used a lot of ex-Kentucky barrels. So when we say ex-Kentucky, you know, you guys all know the big distilleries around Kentucky. We source a lot of their barrels and we, you know, that's one of our advantages is we source them fresh. Mm -hmm. when and so when we were selecting the, the distillate, uh, we wanted something between eight to 12 years old. Uh, we were looking at sourcing from Jamaica, which we sourced from and some other places. Uh, but the unique thing about the, the product that we picked on, which was the El Salvador, is it was such a vanilla bomb. It was dessert in a glass. And it, we thought that this would be a really good prototype to see how barrels could influence its maturation over a shortened period of time. And we, we really selected the base product because it was very, I mean, it was very singular. Um, it didn't have a lot of complexity from the nose to the finish. And we wanted to pick a base product that we could then influence. And that's how we, that's why on the nose you get so, you get so much vanilla, you get, it's such, it's so dessert heavy. Mm -hmm. you know, what we did was we took this rum that we imported. It was 10 years old, but it's obviously mostly ex bourbon. That's what most rum is. And what we did was we selected a variety, like different types of barrels. And then we decided we were going to make a small batch at the end. So we have in here um, toasted ex bourbon, which you guys probably know quite a few Kentucky distillers that do that. We have ex rye barrels. We have pure ex bourbon barrels, and then we also imported some sherry barrels and some port barrels because we're also fans of you know a lot of the sherry cask finish, port cask finish, as well as a lot of honestly the Highland scotches you run into that are you know sherry cask scotches. So what we did was we blended all those barrels back together at the end to kind of balance everything out. Um, we call it dessert in a glass. You know, a lot of people have asked us why. It's so, you know, why we, did we add sugar or something? The answer is no. We don't add any additives to our rum other than the flavors you get from the barrel. But these barrels are very interesting. They added a lot of unique flavors. And by doing a small batch of it, we were able to kind of balance it out. And kind of what we figured out from the intake was that, I mean, uh, there's only one distillery in El Salvador. Um, so it was obviously Colin Still. Uh, we do bring in a lot of, of pot still products that have a higher ester count, if you will. But 
but this one, um, it was it was high column still. Uh, I, I don't know if, if, I mean, so to tell you guys a little bit about the Caribbean, um, they don't have, they don't grow white oak on the Caribbean. Uh, so they, they don't have Caribbean barrels. And they, and I have to tell a lot of people in Kentucky this, but um, so they, you know, they import all their barrels. Jack Daniels appears to be the single source of most Caribbean yeah. um, distillers. I would say Jack Daniels and then Jim Beans. Funny thing is, they all say it's like bourbon, and then they send me a Jack Daniels barrel, and I'm like, "Sir, you are in the middle of a very contentious <laughs> debate <laughs> that you don't realize." And you know, it's some nice man from you know a Caribbean island. Like, this is bourbon, and I'm like, "Oh man." Let's just stop the conversation there. You know, I'm not ready to. This is this is the most contentious debate of our times. Is Jack Daniel's bourbon? So, and, and, and again, we, you guys see in the notes coming in here, we're, we're yeah, talking yeah. Laffy Taffy, yeah, a couple times, uh, vanilla milkshake, which I get I, to me that this smells like a vanilla milkshake, almost like it's so good. It's like the the ones where it's fake, like a McDonald's, vanilla, yeah. which isn't really a milkshake. It's some chemicals that the, smells like the most awesome milkshake. The one that ever, I say uh, that then sticks with people is creme brulee. Creme brulee, yeah. 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 You get a little bit of that like baking spice, caramelized smokiness, just a slight hint, but then a huge vanilla aspect to it as well vanilla. in the nose, yeah. You're getting that a lot. Ice cream, uh, uh, boiled custard, it says. Uh, Sweet vanilla notes that keeps coming up. What's interesting about the import game, and, and I think everybody on here can agree that, that barrels have a huge influence on how a flavor is dictated. And so obviously the barrels that were picked for this product were, were probably two or three times used. Their, their life cycle is almost over. So there was not a huge oak factor in the base fact, in the base product, be it that the barrels were probably already almost spent. So um, we knew that, that we could do, we could try our hardest to influence, to create a middle body and a finishing palette that yeah. would appeal to an American whiskey audience. Gents, this, this tastes like creme brulee with whiskey notes, man. You guys yeah. nailed it. It's fantastic. The thing I'll point out is like the export next sherry or French oak. And that's where you get the baking spice from. If you notice mm -hmm. that little touch of like cinnamon and clove in the finish, that's the French oak. So, you know, we tried every barrel individually, all 22 barrels. And like the French oak barrels were just like big tannin spice bombs. And yeah. the bourbon barrels and rye barrels are much sweeter in the vanilla aspect. And if you look at like the breakdown of what's in, you know, American oak versus French oak, the vanillas, the sweeter caramel notes are very high in American oak. And all the tannin and baking spice notes are very high in French. And so by blending those two together, we kind of got this happy medium, you know? Yeah. So t tell us a little bit about this one, because uh, I know you guys, you, you, you know, you're, you're doing one-offs. You're, you're buying your, your rum, you're, you're blending it together, yeah. or whatever you're doing, and then you, you bottle it and you sell it. So is this one that's available now? Is it coming out? Where, where are so we at on this? This one is available now. This is our largest batch we've ever done. Um, this is fi about 5,000 bottles. Okay. Um, you know, we're distributed in Kentucky, Tennessee, uh, Illinois, going that's into Texas. Cool. But also online, sealbox.com actually carries our El Salvador, Kentucky cast online. And they, you know, they ship to 40 something states as well. Um, and then we're launched, to your point, Steve, we launch a lot of single barrels as well. We, we kind of mix it up small batches where we think we can do, do justice and then single barrels where, you know, when you taste a barrel and it's amazing, why mess with that? So when you're in Kentucky and you want to buy some of this, is like Westport Whiskey and Wine, do they have it or Liquor Barn? Or I would ask you to go to, to so we can only control the price that we sell it to a distributor at. Uh -huh. um, and I, I don't mean to disparage anybody, but um, Liquor Barn has us at the highest price, which okay. is upsetting to me, but that's my own personal vendetta. Uh, State Liquors um, on Frankfurt Avenue has a very fair price. Westport Whiskey has a very fair price. Uh, Old Town Liquors on Bardstown Road. Most of the independent bottlers in Louisville, or I'm sorry, independent liquor stores, correct, have, yeah. have sub eighty-three dollar prices. And we want this to be, you know, seventy-nine ninety-nine to to eighty-three dollar price. You shouldn't be paying ninety-five dollars for this product. 
Okay. Yeah. What Westport whiskey and wine is uh, is my kind of my go-to these days. So yeah, I'm glad to hear it's there, and I'm glad to hear they're charging a good price for it. They're best. They're the best for bringing unique offerings in that area. You know, yeah. They they pride themselves on their selections, and they do a great job. Yeah, guys, one more question, and then we do need to open up the questions for everybody, but sure. it's not about this product. We did play cards Friday night. Turner, you brought a bottle of uh, a, a very unique rum, kind of a once-in-a-lifetime mm -hmm. gift that you guys were able to score this. Tell us a little bit about that and when we can expect to see that one. This might be something that we want to so, get. I'll get, I'll get the bottle. Please. So, uh, yeah, so this is this is interesting. Um, and, you know, you know we, we've all grown up in our experience in, in this endeavor. Um, and I, I look at a lot of people on this call and I know that you all have all dedicated a lot of, a lot of time and energy out of your life to learn about this industry and to, to dedicate your passion to it. Um, and so part of, part of a big part of our, do, our job is finding the right products to import. And so we go through a couple different importers. Um, and it's funny, we, we got this list of things that we could buy from them. And you know, if you look at the list starting in 2017 to where we're at now, obviously we did not fuck this up because now they are giving us much better options to pick from. And they had some, some sub, sub 2000 products on there and they did not put this Guadalupe on there. And Jordan, just reached out randomly and was like, do you guys have any 1998 Guadalupe? And, um, or Guadalupe, I'm sorry. And to, to tell anybody on this call that is unaware, Guadalupe is traditionally an agricole now pro product. And when they started in the late, yeah. This is my personal vendetta slash mission. Um, you know, when you're an independent bottler, you always kind of look jealously on European independent bottlers when you're in the rum space. Like there's a lot of European independent bottlers that have been doing magnificent rums for the last 20 years. They've never brought it to the U.S. And honestly, that's why we're in business. I finally got tired of that. And I was like, well, if no one else is going to do it, I'm going to do it myself. You know, like because I love the independent single cask one off rums that you can experience when you go to other countries. Nobody does it here. One of them on my bucket list was, there was this long story about in Guadalupe, there's this wonderful distillery called Bellevue. And when they were getting started, they brought in this one batch of awesome molasses and made a bunch of barrels and sold them on the independent market one time to fund their distillery. Fast forward 18 years and more, and those casts are starting to come up and like a lot of independent bottlers in Europe are winning awards with it. And, you know, the distillery in Guadalupe is like, what the hell? You know, this sells for more than our normal rum. And everyone's like, yeah, it's because it's amazing. So for me, I'd always been looking. Um, in the last year, because of COVID, because of tariffs, because of Brexit, because of a lot of things, a lot of those random one-off casts that people had been sitting on for a long time came available. And so I kept asking, I always asked, you know, brokers, anyone that would listen, do you have any 1998 Guadalupe from Bellevue that was the molasses base? So not their agricole. Always got nose back. Uh, six, I guess, seven months ago now, someone said yes. And I was like, send me a sample, put me down, I want it. You know, like I, I want to taste it first and make sure it's not the weirdest thing I've ever tasted in my life, but I want it if it is what I think it is. Um, so, you know, they sent me two samples of two barrels. I was like, this is exactly what I've been looking for. You know, it's one of the most famous independent bottlings of all time. And we got some. So we got two barrels in. It took six months of import. It was the craziest, like, it was stuck in customs in various places forever because of, you know. But it, 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 so you got it. It's in the bottle now. When, yep. when, will, when will that be hitting the stores? We got about a month for registration, right, for the different states. Um, so Kentucky, I'd say about a month to get registered with the state and through a distributor. Um, you we're you are talking a, a, a price yeah. point of what? Because this is, again, very special. It's a you know, once in a yeah. lifetime opportunity. It was not like cheap that. to get either. So. Right, right. I know it's very expensive. So, so yeah. what are we talking for about? So the label says 22 years because it sat through customs so long, it is actually 23 years old. So we are talking a 23 year old drinkable product that is not overly oaked and totally fucked. Uh, it's gonna be <laughs> sub $300. So it, we, yeah, we are okay. shooting for about 280. Uh, we know that's a little steep, but 
again, I do want to reiterate, um, because we dealt, dabbled in the rum space, we can do some things that have not been done before. This is the first American release of this yeah. product. I agree. First, it's, it's huge. You don't have to apologize for the price. It, it, it's 100% deserves that. And like I said, uh, I got to try it myself. If you get the opportunity to see a bottle um, and, and you have the means, like Ferris Bueller, if you have the means, I highly recommend it. I'm so. taking it to, to Emily and Chris at Westport on Thursday to, sh to have them try it as well. They're going to be our flagship store if we can get it carried into Kentucky. Nice. Well, just, I'm not asking for any favors. Just let me know when it hits the shelves. And, yep. uh, so the other thing is we're going to work with some online guys to see if we can get at least a pre-order. You know, I don't want anyone to carry something they can't sell. Right. Yeah. And for me, this was a passion project. It was totally like, I know this is dumb, but I'm going to do it anyways, because I've always wanted to. So we're going to have an online retailer, at least one that's going to do a pre-order as well. So anyone outside of Kentucky, you know. And also, yeah. we are only two dudes. So anybody can reach out to us yeah. on social media. And you're that's talking a good about answer, these guys. So, all right. Well, gentlemen, thanks for joining us. And I want yeah. what I want to do now is I, I, I want to leave. We just got about 10 minutes. and I do want to leave time for people to ask questions. So. Uh, feel free to open up your microphone now if you have a question. It can be for everybody. It can be for one distillery individually. Ask away or send it through the chat and I will ask it on your behalf. Joe, were you taking off mute? No, I saw Joe moving. I thought he was going to ask a question. Anybody have a question for anybody here tonight? That's awesome. Let me kick things off, if you don't mind. Uh, let, let me ask Andrew, the guys at uh, uh, Copper Fiddle. I'm curious, uh, you're using 15-gallon barrels, and, and you said you're trying to accelerate the maturation. How long are you actually maturing your, your whiskey in those barrels? So what you're drinking is uh, nine months in quarter cask and then three months on uh, toasted oak steak. Okay, okay, gotcha. And we have some barrels that are hanging out in uh, our... Uh, aging project so we got some that will sit for a year two years and beyond um and we'll see where they're hanging out at have you ever tried going to a 53 gallon barrel uh we're doing 30s next 30s next okay 30s next and then we'll graduate into 53s once uh everything kind of settles back into where we, where we hope it settles into yeah i think you'll find a a, a pretty huge uh, difference in in the, in the maturation yeah we look forward to getting to that point yeah. Appreciate it. You know, we, we, as, as some had alluded to and has, as we know, um, MGP is a large part of um, the portfolio of some individuals who are first starting out um, and totally respectable. And it's, it has to be done at a certain point. Right. Um, and we were talking um, offline before we started recording um, that um Andy and I like to push the envelope with, uh, with Jim and to say, you know, what, what can we do now to make the best stuff that we can make now to be our product moving forward to watch the evolution of our product and uh, to really say that, you know, it's ours grain to glass. Like everything that we've done is our blood, sweat and tears and swear words. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, our mostly, small, it's, it's our small batch. It really and, is. And it's all handmade and it's all our small batch. And, you know, uh, that 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 when you when you're in a little town uh, like Lake Zurich, Illinois, uh, you know, and 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 you're making everything right here with the water uh, from from the town, and uh, everything uh, everything's done right in this little building, and yeah. and uh, we're we're just trying to work through a work through our process, and you know, have something that's uh, you know decent product, you and know, they can only be made here. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's sort of fun. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We, We're we, getting there. Yeah, we wanted we yeah. wanted to do the the low rider cruise to the town as opposed to the drag strip five point four down the street. You know what I mean, so yeah. <laughs> well, kudos, guys. I appreciate what you're doing. Thank, Thank you, Jim. Thank you, sir. Other questions? Anything anybody want to ask to any of our presenters today? Hey, Steve, I got one for you. Uh, for I guess for everybody. Any single barrel offerings or other unique products we should be looking for coming down the pipeline or what we can be, can be looking for right now that you guys have that, that's something that's just unique across the board uh, that we can either order directly or, um, or find someplace on a shelf? 
Let's go. Let's, let's go through everybody here. So, so Greg, we'll, we'll go in the order we did this thing. So, Greg, we'll go with you first. Okay. So, yeah, actually, you know, the, the stuff that we've laid down, the first stuff we laid down was actually at, at Bardstown Bourbon Company was in August of 2018. So, it's not going to be four years old till you know late next year when we're even considered bottling it again. I've been checking it every six months to see how it's progressing. It's progressing wonderfully. So, you know, we may do some blending of it uh, once it hits that four-year-old mark. Likewise, every time I, I any promotional visit I do to liquor stores or, or even on-premise, off-premise, uh, you know, people are asking, hey, when can we do a barrel pick? And I don't believe in future barrel picks. You, you've got to you've got to wait till it's getting closer to four years old to see where it's headed. And um, uh, in, in my opinion, from my experience. So, uh Probably later next year, we'll start opening up the doors and, and we're working out the logistics now for single barrels. But uh, when we begin that that uh, process of, of barrel picks, we'll definitely uh, be having a single barrel. Sounds good. Copper and Fiddle team, how about you guys? Uh, so you'll be the first to know uh, our apple brandy that we had uh, five different varietals of a uh, local apple pulp and uh, juice donated to us that we uh, fermented with our, with our yeast strain and then distilled in our reflux still infused with cardamom, vanilla, some allspice, cinnamon, and, uh, and nutmeg. Uh, that'll be released. Uh, the label hopefully comes to me tomorrow. You'll see that hit the, the only shelf here at the distillery on, uh, on Thursday or Friday. So we have an apple brandy release coming out. Uh, as for barrel picks, we've done two so far. Uh, our first two ever as a distillery with, uh, with Gold Eagle Wine and Spirits in Libertyville. Uh, we will start to as... Uh, Rob kind of alluded to our, our little aging project up here, uh, do some releases through dist the uh, distillery. And um, yes, I personally like to, I, I would like to hold our barrel releases uh, in-house. Oh yeah, That's it, my, it's all gonna come through here. Right. So come have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Landis, how about you? Any Anything special coming out, unique things we need to be on the on the lookout for? Well, you know, we talked about the the ten year release, which will be uh, on sale starting this Friday, but that'll be a tasting room exclusive. Now, we've been doing barrel picks for almost a year, um, and we're we're doing single barrel cask strength. We do a lot of custom stuff with stores in Michigan, so you know, I'll do a preliminary sample. I'll bring down like sixteen to twenty barrels. I'll pull like maybe my eight favorite, send it to those guys. They'll pick ones they like. We do a barrel. They get the barrel. They get all the booze bottled. Um, and we're three or four deep uh, doing customs in Michigan. We also have, not all the time, but I would say maybe two to three times a quarter, we got single barrel picks going out to the MLCC in Michigan. Where they go, it's kind of first come first serve, but we also normally have a rye whiskey and a bourbon single barrel at the distillery or the distillery tasting rooms. Um, so right now we've got a couple really nice single barrel picks in the MLCC. We got a couple, um, I think we got a really nice bourbon single barrel pick in house. Um, but, you know, back to that whole sense of, you know, you can put up 20 barrels, you know, eight barrels, uh, a combination of a week's worth of work. And of each of those barrels, maybe one or two are going to be primed for a single barrel release. And you just don't know it until you try it and you were close to the date. So for me, um, you know, what's coming down the line, I really don't know. I mean, we're sampling, we got 750 barrels in the, the warehouse right now, full um, variety of ages. Um, and we produce over 1200 so far. So in a decade's worth of production, I mean, we still have the majority of every single barrel we've made. Um, of course, you look at your, your production curve and you start with a couple and then you move up, but we have more and more inventory hitting that four year, five year marker. Um, and a lot of those I think are going to be prime for single barrel picks. So I guess the answer is I can't give you specifics other than I know we've got them now. Um, <laughs> and what's coming in the future. I mean, who knows, but you know, knows? I'm optimistic because, okay. because we've had some really, really tasty ones come down before. Okay. All right. Uh, Turner and Jordan, you guys obviously shared a bunch of cool things. You got this coming out. You've got we the Guadalupe. Got Anything else right. you need to be on the lookout for? All right, Steve, are you ready? This is the first time we've actually told anyone. So okay. you guys saw the, the 22 year Guadalupe, which was, you know, you tried it, Steve. It's amazing. Once in a lifetime bottle, if you can get uh, it. We also, at the same time, about a six month import, brought in a 22 year four square. Ah, wow. So, yeah, Very you know, cool. the four square, the Pappy of Rum, and all that jazz. Um, so both yeah. of these, I would say, in the next month to a month and a half, it's a registrate. They're already bottled, obviously. It's just kind of going through the paperwork. Okay. Uh, so email me. Doing, 
is email me at rob at copperfiddle.com. I want a bottle of that uh, four square. Okay. Okay. You also want a bottle of the Guadalupe, trust me. Yeah, both. This believe it or not, this yeah. happens every time we do this event. The, yeah. the, the distillery representatives all want to know each other. They always yeah, afterwards they yeah. email me and say, Could you give me contact information for this, this, and I'm like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, then that's the, how uh, this doesn't work. The other fun one we're, we've been doing, Steve, that should be like Sealbox sold our first barrel of it, but we brought in some eight-year-old Foursquare and we've been aging it in Kentucky for about 10 months now. So we have, you know, X weeded bourbon barrels from Buffalo Trace. You can, you know, divine from there what kind of barrel it is. We also used um, rye barrels from one of our favorite distilleries in Kentucky that is traditionally used in you know, it's traditionally used in a lot of cocktails. It might be called Rittenhouse, it might not. Um, you know, <laughs> we also, we, so our big thing is we're as particular on our barrels as we are on our, like we try to find the right barrel for the right rum, right? And we're from Kentucky. We obviously love a lot of the bourbon flavors. So we're never gonna make, you know, like, so for example, like a 1997 United Distillers Bernheim weeder came up on the market. It was obviously used in, you know, a 23 year old product that was bottled recently. You all can, you know, divine what that may have been. Of course, you know, we have a good relationship with a lot of the used barrel brokers and we're the only guys in town that really do the used barrel game. If we don't buy the barrels and kind of keep it in the local market, it usually gets flat packed and shipped to, you know, Europe or Jamaica where people don't really appreciate what it is. So if you think about a 23 year old weeded bourbon, you know, that's been bottled in the last few months. I mean, Kentucky straight weeded bourbon, there's very few on the market that would be that. I wouldn't want to infringe on anyone's trademarks, but what we do with those barrels is we then try to pick the right rum for it. So we do have some, you know, eight-year-old Foursquare that we've imported that has been in weeded X bourbon barrels, um, X rye barrels. We even did a brandy barrel recently that is uh, actually started life as a 1981 ancient age barrel which was really cool to see, you know, you, you buy a brandy barrel that you think you'll like, and then you notice on the side, it has like ancient age distillery 1981 for its original fill date. So that one we're bottling next month, that four square that was aged in that brandy barrel that was originally an ancient age 1981 barrel, um, that'll go on sale on Sealbox. We nice. also had the nice. sweeted Kentucky bourbon going to uh, places like Westport Whiskey and Wine. So do you guys, I, I think you, you guys need a newsletter. Do you guys have a newsletter? Yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah. Yeah. So, because we need to keep that. up with that stuff. There's a lot of stuff you guys got going on. So I know. Yeah. Well, Get us signed it. up and we'll, uh, we'll keep everybody informed. That's the advantage and disadvantage of being mostly a single barrel house. Right. right. Like exactly. a lot of our stuff is one off. Right. But you get a little newsletter together and we can talk about that. Time yeah. for a last question. What, who's got the last question? All right, can I jump in? There's Bear. We can't finish. We couldn't finish until Bear comes in. Here we go. All right. Last question right. tonight is going to be Bear, and then we will end this thing. Okay, Bear. I'm going to jump around really quick. So I was not familiar at all with chicken cock, so I will start looking for some chicken cock, Greg. Um, not familiar with the product at all. It was very interesting, um, and I like the idea of picking stuff from around and blending it together. It's really cool. Um, as far as copper fiddle, uh, I won't talk about my drunken trip around uh, the L and Revolution and Half Acre and Bad Apple and my cell phone going dead and my wife wondering where the hell I'm at why she's at a convention. But that's okay because I had a great time. Um, but I, I'm going to seek you guys out. So I, I am going to come taste your product. I sent you invited. Let's do it. Right, so, um, and then over to uh, Grand Traverse. Mm -hmm. I have been to several of your tasting rooms. Um, and I have not been up to the distillery. I want to do that, but we do have a local store right now that does have a pick in and I've avoided it, but, uh, I, I hope they do one of these rye picks because I really enjoyed your rye. Uh, some of your bourbons I haven't enjoyed as much. I thought they were interesting and I liked some of them, but the rye I really liked. So I am going to jump over to that. And yeah, uh, check your place out. Cause we have a, uh, we have a, a single barrel rye pick in the MLCC right now. Okay. Well, you're, you're at the liquor cabinet in Lambertville right now. They have a bourbon pick down there, but I keep trying to get them to do more rise. I usually help them do picks and they left me out of the loop on this one and they just brought it in. So it is what it is. So, and then to you guys at the end, uh, I love the, when you brought out the four square and talked about the four square, that's exactly what I was going to compare your stuff to. I'm glad you're doing the blending. 
Um, I've done two different uh, tastings now with Foursquare. Uh, they're, they're hilarious, uh, you know, where they're from. And it, it just, they were a good time and a couple of other groups I'm in. Um, but uh, I really, really would look forward to both the uh, Guadalupe and the other, if I can get a hold of it. Unfortunately, I'm in Michigan, but I'll see what I can do. So uh, great stuff you're doing. And I really enjoyed the one you gave us tonight to taste. What, what I will say about Foursquare and what I really appreciate about what he does in terms of he'll release his year statement, which is just aged in Jack Daniels or bourbon, and then he'll do finishes. Yep. So uh, for anyone that's trying to get into rum, it's a good place to start because you can buy anywhere from 04 to 08, which are phenomenal. Um, but then you can also buy the, uh, the, the, Dante or whatever the, the, the finish is, and you can yeah. get a sense of what cognac or sherry. I is. saw you had the Probitas bottle up there. Yeah. You started off with the Probitas. I mean, yeah. it's a I mean, great it's, bottle for 35 bucks. So, and you know, the Probitas is four square and then Worthy Park. Right. Um, to me, those are like two of the gold standards of rum. Like you can't go wrong with either of them and they're a great place to start. You know, they're both purists on the rum spectrum. No additives, you know, very rigid production aging processes. Like they're, you know, they're amazing rum distilleries. When I was on their tasting, I didn't realize the history of rum and how yeah. that nobody, so anybody that distilled couldn't sell. They had yeah. to go to somebody else and then they did a finish or they did the barreling or they did whatever. So the distillers didn't actually get to sell their product. And I never understood that. And, and when I went through the first tasting with them, they, educated us and it was really interesting to listen to the process that it went through and then the different regions and how every region has its own taste and it's just really cool very good very good well what i want to do is i want to have everyone thank our four distilleries that are here today a part of this made for a great evening thank you so much uh, we had a fantastic night. We got to try uh, five actually great products tonight. We got the bonus one. We always appreciate that. So I want to say good night to everyone and thank you. The official recording part of this is over. We'll stick around. We can chat, talk about whatever you like. I'm going to be here. So thanks a lot, everyone. Take care.